Uh, thank you, Tom, for the invitation uh, to this day's conference. Both personally and professionally, it's very valuable to be here for myself. I studied more than 20 years ago at ANU, both on the Asia and the Pacific side, so it's nice to come back. Professionally, it's very important for us in the bureaucracy to engage with the academic world, not only to test the ideas that we're using now, but also to look at new ideas, and I think we can only benefit from further engagement on that front. Um, I followed after Colin. For those of you that will be here throughout the conference, I apologize. A colleague once said to me that all power corrupts, and PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely, <laughs> and I'm afraid. I didn't take all that advice, and I do have a series of slides, but hopefully it'll help uh, convey some of the key messages that we're looking at in terms of our agenda this year. Uh, I, I think it was very good to come after Colin because of the, the provocative points, in my view, that he raised, but they're also very important issues because one of the things we're looking at this year as a presidency is to look at the accountability of the G20. How can we be held accountable for what we have said we will do? And, and I'll touch on that in various ways. Uh, through the slides, and it's also important to look at, in our minds, where the G20 can add value. Because the G20 is really a form of consensus, and when those leaders agree, they can bring great momentum and force to take action forward. But it's not in itself an implementing organisation. There is no secretariat, there's no pledging mechanism. So it's, it's a means by which we bring leadership to issues facing the world. But it's also not representative. So the point on engagement and outreach is a very important one. And that leads me to just a very brief explanation of how I fit in the, the bureaucracy we have this year in support of the G20 presidency. Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, we work to the Prime Minister's office and through the Sherpa, who gives primary advice and leads the work on the G20 this year, and primary advice to the Prime Minister. That's Dr. Heather Smith. She's complemented by the Finance Deputy and Treasury, who gives advice to the Treasurer, who leads the finance track within the G20. For DCAT, I have responsibility for the trade and development aspects of the G20 agenda, but I'm also responsible for outreach and engagement with the international community. In particular, outreach beyond the G20, because we don't have a license on good ideas, so we need to go out and listen and talk about the impact of the agenda we're looking at this year on people and countries outside of the G20. But why is the G20 in itself important? Uh, just in terms of some basic introductory points, you know, it represents 85% of the world economy, 80% of trade, and two-thirds of foreign direct investment. But it's rather a unique forum because beyond those statistics, it brings together emerging markets and industrialized economies. So we saw in 2008 quite a substantial response to the financial crisis that escalated or lifted up the G20 to a leaders level forum. Prior to that, it had been finance ministers, treasury ministers, if you like, who had been meeting since the late 1990s. Now we saw, for the first time, leaders become involved in response to a crisis, but now we're going beyond that to more substantial issues as some of the economies around the world change and adjust post-financial crisis. For Australia, we look outwards, we value our links with other countries, and we're accustomed to working collaboratively. So we hope this year we can take that, including our strong links in the Asia-Pacific, and develop our agenda. When I talk about the agenda for Australia, I have to acknowledge that the G20 has a rolling agenda, and in fact, probably 80 to 85% of what goes on continues each year. But our primary target this year is set out here on the slide, and it was agreed by leaders in St. Petersburg at the summit in Russia. And they agreed that economies in the G20 need to focus on promoting stronger economic growth and employment outcomes, and making our global economy more resilient to shocks. We didn't see the global financial crisis coming, but we can take steps to prepare for what might next come. So we need new approaches to lift growth, though, because in response to the global financial crisis, many countries looked at fiscal policy, monetary policies, but those options are limited. So the judgment by leaders was to look at private sector as a driver of growth and take steps domestically towards lifting growth and therefore jobs. I'll touch on some of that now. But I'd like to say, you know, achieving this will not be easy, but the governments have committed to taking it forward, and the test will be to see that we deliver practical and concrete outcomes at the end of the year. And it goes back to the question of accountability. Just to talk about the challenge that we face, um, the chart really is only useful just to show the progressive dropping in the forecast. Until January this year, the IMF had revised the forecast for global economic output successfully down each year. Uh, January saw for the first time an upward forecast, first time in two years, but the downside risks still remain and we see real gaps in advanced economies and domestic weaknesses in some emerging economies and therefore continuing concern. 
As I mentioned, many had looked at fiscal and monetary policy. Now we need to find new sources of growth. And many in the Asia Pacific and elsewhere are still struggling to create enough jobs for their people. The World Bank, for example, suggests there are now more than 600 million young people around the world who are neither studying nor working. This graphical slide just explains a little bit some of the actions we're proposing to take to stimulate growth, which leaders in St. Petersburg committed to. We hope to improve productivity and competitiveness, strengthen investment infrastructure, encourage trade, make it easier to do business, and boost employment. <coughs> Saying that in itself might be easy. What's distinctive for you in, the, in terms of the outcomes last year was we have a commitment from each country to go away and develop its own comprehensive domestic strategy. It has to come back at the summit at the end of this year with clear-cut, concrete, detailed actions how through domestic action we would address these items and will be held accountable for them in future years and they will all be made public. If I just move on and touch on each of them a little bit. Uh, practice, attracting private infrastructure investment. As you can see on the slide, the OECD expects a huge demand investment worldwide. Our sense is that building infrastructure drives growth in the short term through investment and employment, but also makes economies more productive in the longer term. In addition to the OECD estimate, the Asia Development Bank has estimated there is a need for 750 billion a year in Asia alone up to 2020. So funding requirements of this size demand that governments work with the private sector. But we need to acknowledge the private sector will only become involved if projects are economically and financially viable. So working together this year through our work program, the finance track particularly, G20 countries are looking to see how it can make it easier for these sort of projects to get off the ground. It could be financial instruments, it could be working with multilateral development banks and assisting this process and looking at the risks associated with it, and in fact looking at some of the banking regulation that's been introduced and what impact that may have on these sort of models. Another key driver of growth is trade. If you look at the charts here, you can see a correlation between GDP growth and goods and services trade. But what is most telling is, if you just look at the timeline along the bottom, we're still to return to the rates of growth that were there before the global financial crisis. In this year, we expect growth to be at 4.5% globally. As to the President, Australia is working with our leaders now to try to focus leaders' discussion on how trade can contribute to economic growth and how, what steps we can take domestically to remove obstacles to private sector participating in, say, global value chains, and a phenomenon which is not new, which, which is changing the way perceived trade flows now. This could be as simple as infrastructure, employment changes, services behind the border, customs issues. It's really up to each country to determine what steps they will take, but we ask each to bring forward new policy ideas beyond the existing proposals they have had in place until now. Of course, growth in itself isn't sustainable, and we want that to be balanced, and that means jobs and lifting job participation. I cited the World Bank figure earlier of 600 million young people around the world that are neither studying nor working. The leaders in St. Petersburg identified unemployment, underemployment, particularly among young people, as one of the key challenges facing us. This sort of issue threatens social cohesion and threatens our future. It's not an issue just for now, it goes on. So G20 countries have committed to bring actions forward to try to create the right environment to grow jobs and to grow opportunities for the private sector. In particular, we're focusing on female participation, structural unemployment, informal employment, and labour market outcomes for young people and vulnerable groups. The focus of each of those will vary according to the economy, reflecting the diverse circumstances, but there are huge productive gains if some economies can address just one element of that. Next, I'd just like to touch on development. Um, empowering development is central to the G20's objectives. We have emerging market economies, both in the G20 and outside. Many of the policies we take impact directly on low-income countries. So we're working to focus on activities that lift growth in both those areas, developed and developing economies. This chart shows a little bit of the relationship between some of the key themes. The finance agenda focuses on investment, infrastructure, modernising tax systems, strengthening the international financial system. I can go into a little bit more detail of them in a little while. On the other side, though, we show some of the work we're doing. We have a dedicated development working group. In 2002, coming out of the Seoul Summit, we had, I think, 14 streams of work. After St. Petersburg, we went through an accountability exercise to assess where was it that the G20 was actually adding value? Where would we do 
the best work without duplicating what we have away in other four already. Because as I mentioned at the outset, the G20 isn't an implementing organization in itself, and its role is to give momentum to action by other international bodies. In many of the issues we're raising, there is already a plethora of international organizations doing work. Our dedicated development working group now is focusing on five streams. They are financial inclusion, effective tax administrations, when I say financial inclusion, it's access to financial services, effective tax administrations, and investment environments. But the issues we're grappling with are very different from what we're dealing with in the finance track, if you like, they're the opposite end of the spectrum. The OECD estimates, for example, on tax, that many low-income countries are losing more and lost revenue each year that they haven't collected than they're obtaining through ODA. So clearly, a small step in this area can make a substantial gain. And we're not promising that step will be achieved in one year. What we're looking at is trying to put in place policies and coordination that will help economies towards that end. I should point out there are two other areas we'll continue this year that aren't listed there that are very important. One is food security. And the reason it's not listed there is we're just going through a, a report with international organizations at the moment to determine whether G20 can add best value. And we've gone through a consultative stage in that, including non-G20 members. And we want to look in particular on agricultural productivity and access to food. The G20 is also looking at human resource development. This follows on work that had a particular focus in the Russia year, last year. And it, the hope is it will lead to a database developed by Russia in December 2020, in 2014 to help developing countries match education and training with future job markets. This follows a platform that was launched in 2013 for the G20 countries themselves. Until now, I've spoken about efforts on the growth side. I might just touch briefly also on the other key important part of the G20's agenda, and that's something we describe as building global economic resilience. The G20 has a real role here, and you're probably aware of some of the steps taken since 2008 in reforming the global financial system, strengthening tax systems, addressing the imbalance, perhaps, as some would describe it, in global institutions in terms of their representativeness, and also strengthening energy market resilience and fighting corruption. I'll touch on each of these briefly. On the financial system, uh, the slide probably says most of what I wish to say, but the key point is here that we need to do what we say. We need to meet our commitments. Many of the G20 countries committed to undertake reforms and push these through either domestically, through regulation, or internationally. Some of us have done that, not all of us have. So we've asked this year, if we can, to try to draw a line, and through this year address those issues that are up here and try to conclude some of them. I think we need to be realistic. Not all will be concluded this year, because as we go through some of them, for example, helping prevent and manage the failure of globally important financial institutions, or too big to fail, this reveals other issues in each economy. Because if you start considering the impact on a particular economy, if major banks fail, you start to sometimes identify other structural weaknesses. Nonetheless, we have got a commitment from our finance ministers and our central bank governors to look at this work and try to draw a line so that we can then start going forward, rather than looking back at what we've promised to do in response to the global financial crisis. Uh, I touched earlier on the development side and strengthening tax systems. Now I'll just briefly touch on the area that, of work that the finance track is looking at in particular. And it says it on the slide, both changes to the global economy have outpaced tax systems around the world. Governments now face increasing difficulty collecting tax where economic activity occurs, which has led to some tax base erosion. This leaking bucket, if you like it, makes it harder for governments to maintain growth-friendly tax systems and manage their budgets in a sustainable way while delivering essential services to the population. So we want to lead to stronger international cooperation in this area to tackle base erosion shifting and profit shifting and also to in support a better exchange of information. The G20 is not opposed to competitive tax rates. What it's in support of is transparency in terms of information. Because we think with this information, individual economies, be they in the G20 or outside, then have the options to make decisions in terms of their tax policy. Now, reforming global institutions. Uh, this is a point that I think Australia and some other members of the G20 are particularly well known for. And we feel that international institutions need to keep pace with current realities. They need to reflect the growing economic weight of the dynamic emerging market economies. That makes them relevant both to the organizations themselves, they function better, but also to the people who are contributing through their taxes to government donations to those international organizations. It also means that there's better representative, representativeness in those organizations. We've done some work on this in IMF reform, and that's listed there. I think we need to acknowledge that that, in terms of the last review, is stalled at the moment. 
but we also need to acknowledge that the one remaining member of the US has committed to work on this issue and the administration is looking to find solutions to ratify the changes that are required. Our finance ministers and central bank governors will look again at that in April and then consider the next IMF review process. Energy market resilience is essential to well-functioning economies. As you know, energy is a key supplier both to households and to businesses. So in 2014, the G20 will support international efforts to improve the operation of global energy markets and the cooperation between major producers and consumers. We've done some work internally on the oil market and exchange of information to improve transparency. We're now having discussions on the gas market, which, although it's not a global market, may offer some potential again in terms of transparency measures to improve stability. We're also looking at energy efficiency and how we can make those markets also more transparent in terms of their investment, and so we're better prepared to meet the energy demands of the future. Corruption. We, can, we have an active corruption task force group and it has been working year on year with business in ways to address corruption. Now, corruption increases costs for real business. I've got there in red one particular point that is just quite striking. Depriving developing countries of up to 40 billion each year. And it's an extraordinary amount of money. So there are practical steps we can all take to reduce those costs. Here the G20 is particularly working with ASEAN and APEC to reinforce work in that region. Just make a few comments on outreach. Um, as I said at the beginning, the G20 is not a representative body and it doesn't portray itself to be that. But it's one which can provide leadership, but given the, the weight, the economic weight it brings when those leaders come together and achieve consensus and therefore give momentum to action in other areas. But outreach is really an important responsibility because the actions we take, the decisions that are made by leaders in the G20 do impact on everyone. Each year, we don't have a secretariat, we have a troika now in place where the previous presidency and ex-presidency and the current try to conduct outreach. In a sense, my, my appointment represents Australia's effort in that regard. Our Sherpa, Dr Heather Smith, is endeavouring to visit every G20 country during her year and have discussions. Our ministers, when they have the opportunity in international forums, now speak in the G20 and in their bilateral meetings with counterparts are addressing those issues. I've attended Chogham, the Asia-Europe meeting and others to meet with delegations to discuss their concerns and will soon go to, for example, meetings in Africa and the Caribbean and later in the Pacific to do the same thing. As I said at the beginning, we don't have a license on good ideas and we're very interested in hearing from others on their views on how the agenda that has been agreed by the G20 may impact on their economies and their people. And they may have insights for us in terms of implementing that better. We of course also have formal partners and like with any organisation, there's a plethora of letters that emerge. Uh, we have a B20, C20, L20, T and Y20, <laughs> which represents business, civil society, labour, Think20, which is the T20, which I, in some way reflects you, and also the U20. Each of these have their own leadership group or steering committee, which are then meant to consult with their communities across both the host countries nation, but also globally. And they will have summits through the year. So for example, we have a trade ministers meeting in July, which will be held back to back with a business summit. Uh, which will have CEOs from in the world. The Think20 in Australia has been coordinated and led by uh, G20 uh, Study Centre in the Lowy Institute, and they've run a series of conferences and have reached out for views from others. Youth20 are uh, working through a portal and collecting views from youth groups, both in Australia and internationally. These are only the formal organisations. Of course, we get a lot of approaches outside of that, and they're most welcome. But in terms of final interaction with the leaders, ministers, and so on, these are the means for which the G20 has decided to engage. There are also many others outside of this now who have also adopted a similar terminology, so it gets a little bit confusing. Um, in terms of guest countries this year, each, each year there are five guests that attend the G20. Uh, some of these are now permanent guests, if you can have a permanent guest. Uh, in our case, uh, I might just point out, uh, the chair of ASEAN is automatically invited now, so in our case, Myanmar is a member. Senegal is invited on behalf of the, as a national chair for this year for the new partnership for Africa's development, uh, as is Mauritania as chair of the Africa Union. Uh, Singapore and New Zealand were our guests coming from the region, and uh, Spain is a permanent guest within the G20, reflecting its role at the beginning of 2008 when the leaders became involved, uh, both in terms of its economic weight and its focus as part of the, the global financial crisis. For us, though, it's very important that the Asia-Pacific has a voice within this forum. Uh, 
Um, nine of the G20 members are in the broader Asia-Pacific region, if we include South America, Australia, Canada, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, Mexico, and United States. I've mentioned the three guests, which also come from the region. And this really reflects the fact that in our view, and I think statistically is proven, the Asia-Pacific is now the major engine of the world economy. Uh, if I use stats from a, another regional organization, that is APEC, in 2012, APEC economies alone accounted for 40% of the world population, 40% of the world trade, and 58% of the GDP. But I probably don't need to tell you that here for an Asia-Pacific conference. I just need to underline that we see it as an important engine for growth, but also an important partner. I look forward to listening to some of the sessions through today and then reading the papers after this conference to learn from you in terms of what you see as the challenges, not only for the G20, but for the region. But there, I'll stop, and thank you.